Greetings, everyone. Uh, this is the very first time I've ever done a wisdom webinar. So let's see if this works well. Um, my name is Dr. Ryan Williams. I am the newly appointed president of Our Lady Seed of Wisdom College. And this is a presentation put on by our beloved Alumni Association. Uh, it sounds like I need to scoot closer so that everyone can hear me better. Let's see, I'm, I'm just testing the sound for a second, everyone. That's interesting. Okay. Maybe it's my volume that's down. Okay, so since I realize uh, I'm live now, I should give a presentation. So this presentation that I'm about to give is going to be a lecture that I derived from a little bit of my experience as an Aristotelian philosopher, and I shared it with the faculty as well, this unfortunate echo. Oh, there's no delay. Well, actually, there probably is, um, but, uh, but only I can experience it. It's uh, one of the wonders of being the host of a live stream presentation. So as I was saying, uh, this is a presentation on a paper I delivered to our faculty about a month and a half ago. It's going to be shorter than the presentation to the faculty, because one of the key components of a faculty presentation is that they're supposed to be boring. So I'm hoping for that not to be the case in this uh, circumstance. That means that I will be able to get to the good and juicy stuff without some of the, the, of the minutia uh, that is required for academic presentations. This will still be very academic, but more like a lecture than a uh, presentation of a paper. So as you know, the title of this presentation is uh, Moving the City. Uh, Aristotle, or no, how does it go? Moving the City, Rhetoric, the Polis, and the Nature of Man and Aristotle. And uh, just to give you an overview, what we're going to be talking about right now or today is what I call the kinetic cause of human excellence. Now, I say kinetic because uh, a lot of times people say efficient, right? They like to use the word efficient, uh, the efficient cause of something, which gives the impression that it's the effect of something else. Um, now, ironically, today, what I talk about is going to be rhetoric and the effect that it has on human life. But when we talk about a kinetic cause, we don't necessarily mean something that comes about by effect. And hopefully the lecture is going to show that to you. So this uh, lecture is going to be composed of four parts. The first thing we have to do is talk about the nature of things. A lot of times human ethical considerations are kind of divorced from what it means to actually exist, right? We tend to think of uh, what we do with regard to moral goods and bads. is something altogether different than what a rock does by just rocking. You know, it just sits there on the floor and it does its rocky thing. It goes to rocky places and that's about it. But what we need to realize for Aristotle at least is, uh, and, and for us really, but I won't go into that so far. Uh, for Aristotle, being is something that is integri integrally connected, right? Whether it be a human being or a, uh, you know, a rock being or a plant being or, or a horse being. Um, when you're talking about existence, uh, the, the rules are going to apply universally, ubiquitously across everything. And uh, that's going to be uh, no less so for humans than for, for different plant species. So what we have to do is we have to understand first how Aristotle saw the world. Now, I know many of you took early courses with us at least one year. Uh, to be alumni, you take a course at least a year with us. So uh, that means all of you had fun, Phil. And fun, I'm sure it was. Um, I'm, I'm also, I make a lot of puns. Uh, I'll try not to do that, but it's an instinct. Um, so the point is, is you had fun, Phil, so you've probably touched upon the four causes of Aristotle. But in case you haven't, when Aristotle talks about the natural world, he talks about natural kinds of things, right? A natural kind of thing would be like a rock, a plant, a tree, a horse. An unnatural or rather a technical or artistic thing would be, you know, you know like a car or a cappuccino maker. Uh, but there's a natural divide between those things, between things that are natural and things that are artificial or artistic. And that bridge is somewhat, uh, un, un, uh, that gap rather is somewhat unbridgeable. So artificial intelligence, for example, brings up a philosophical question, right? Whether is, is it metaphysically possible, uh, which could also be a subject for another lecture. But for Aristotle, anyway, uh, these natural things, they have four causes in them, right? Or at least living things have four causes, right? You have what's called the formal cause that gives the nature of a thing, like a dog or a horse. It's dogginess, it's horsiness. Now, we're not Platonists. 
uh, we aren't as Catholics, and Aristotle certainly wasn't, even though he did study with Plato. Uh, I mean, he was a Platonist that he's a friend of Plato and probably supported Plato in many different things, uh, but not in this one. Uh, so you, we're not talking about horsiness as it's floating around out there in the world of the forms, but we're talking about an instantiated horse, right? So a horse has a nature, and that nature, uh, that form, that eidos, which is interesting because eidos is the Greek word for form. Aristotle used either eidos or morphe, but what's, what's very interesting is both eidos and morphe has, have uh, visible analogs, or rather they are they're words meant to describe visualizations, right? So the, the morphe is the shape and the eidos is the look of a thing. So it's funny that Aristotle would talk about uh, the form of something, what gives it its essence as sort of the intellectual look of something. At any rate, we have the formal cause of thing. What, what makes a thing itself? Well, it's definable essence, as it were, in Thomistic terms. I understand most of us will be fans of Thomas, uh, St. Saint, Saint Thomas, uh, and not Thomas More. Uh, I mean, of course, we're probably fans of him too, especially if we're married. At any rate, you also have the final cause, which is the thing uh, to that pulls a natural entity to its completion, right? So baby cows turn into big adult cows that taste delicious and graze rather than browse. Uh, acorns turn into oak trees. The oak tree in that case is the final, ca is the final cause in the case of baby cows. Um, it's the adult, full adult cow with all of its uh, functioning attributes fully firing. And uh, it grazing rather than browsing is interesting. You know, when you browse, you pull from the top. When you graze, you pull from the bottom. So deer browse, cows graze. Um, and that's just part of the essence of what those animals are, the mode whereby they complete themselves through nourishment. Uh, the next kind of cause of, is the material cause, the stuff that we're made out of, um, like chairs are made out of, I don't know, whatever this thing is made out of, leather, uh, maybe the cow. <laughs> uh, you know, you are made out of, your cells that have a distinct DNA. What's very interesting about you and that uh, thing that fixes you is uh, there's a transmutation that's involved when repairing yourself. Uh, we'll talk about that when we get to the next cause, which is the cause that we're really interested in. And that is the kinetic cause, kinesis, right? Uh, or the efficient cause in more of common parlance, but um, you know, inappropriate. Oh, no, inappropriate's been a strong word. It's, it's just not the way we say things around here. It's the kinetic cause, the efficient cause, the motive cause, the internal principle of motion, whereby the final cause is realized in any, any natural thing. So this is a very important uh, cause for Aristotle, among other reasons, because only, only living things have it, right? Only living things have this internal principle of motion, whereby uh, the very nature of the thing comes to its completion, its intellechion. Uh, which is another funny word that Aristotle actually coined. Um, it has to do with the natural inhering of the telos of a thing, right? If I had a board, I'd write down N, telos, kion, which is the sort of substantive termination of something. So, you know, this is the telos inhering within a thing, the intellechion. Um, and so the kinetic or the motive cause is what makes you and I grow. It, it's what makes cows, you know, baby cows grow into delicious adult cows. It's what makes walnuts grow into acorns. Uh, of course, it's the final cause that is sort of uh, giving direction to this internal principle of motion. Uh, but it's the internal principle of motion that really allows uh, natural development until the completion of a thing, right? So we don't constantly grow. There's no 50 foot woman uh, or man, thank goodness, because uh, we, don't, we don't grow uh, just without stop, but there's an internal limit, right? Uh, a definition, a definite end to which our growing and this internal principle of motion works. Now, something very interesting about natural kinds, think about you. You get a cut on your arm, uh, you know, wrestling bears or whatever. You go out and you have a hamburger and a few days later, your arm is fully healed. Now, what's very interesting is your body has transmuted that, that material that it got from the hamburger and put it in your arm. You know, if you take that little sliver of skin that's grown back, give yourself another cut, uh, you give it a test and you don't find bovine DNA there, right? You find you DNA. And that's very peculiar because beforehand there was bovine DNA uh, when you ate the hamburger. But what happened was that internal principle of motion along with the material tools at its disposal, namely the organs and the natural bioprocesses have effectively transmuted, changed, substantially altered the nature of material. This is fundamentally different, different than, uh, than fueling up a car, 
All right. So uh, fundamentally different than any sort of artificial mechanism that gives itself energy for the sake of motion. Uh, it doesn't transmute or transform one substance from uh, into another. Uh, it might alter things, uh, rip things apart, destroy things, but it doesn't substantially unite things in a way that makes uh, a living entity, right? That flesh that you uh, turn the cow into is living flesh. Um, and so this internal principle of motion is very, very important for Aristotle with regard to natural kinds of things. Now, Another principle for Aristotle of what a natural kind is, is that it has this internal principle of motion. It's a very technical expression. He says, always or for the most part, uh, an internal principle of motion that always or for the most part leads to the natural end of a thing, right? So the vast majority of, of cows, right? When they're born, they grow up and they grow up into cows and, and everything works out well. But on occasion, you get a two-headed cow, right? Or you get a cow that's uh, born with some sort of material deficiency. And typically the cow dies. It doesn't grow to its completion, doesn't terminate in some fully functioning uh, entity that it was meant to be. Now this, this is, of course, Aristotle calls it a monstrosity and it's a failure of final cause. But that failure, since final cause is a really an immaterial thing, that failure really happens by virtue of the internal principle of motion and, and some deficiency in the matter that was being used to complete the final cause. So, but what's most important here is that natural kinds, natural things, things that are alive, um, always or for the most part come to their end. Now here's where the bugaboo, let's say, comes about in Aristotle's writing, is that Aristotle thinks humans are natural, and he rightly thinks that, right? We are natural things. We're not even the highest thing in the world for Aristotle. We're just sort of on the rung. Uh, we're on a high rung, but not the highest, right? You have the immaterial substances, and then you have the unmoved mover. Um, and the heavens and whatnot are better or higher than us, at least in nature. And so for us, we're just kind of middle of the road, natural kinds of things. And uh, for any of you who've studied Aristotle's Nicomachean Ethics, and yeah, if I were to ask you, what is the end of man? And uh, I don't mean his death, but I mean, what is the, the, the thing that leads to his completion or rather the place that he arrives at when he is fully what he's meant to be? It's happiness. Right? Happiness, and all of you should have memorized this, is an activity of the soul in conformity with virtue for Aristotle. Uh, we'll get to some of the details of that, but for now, let's say uh, simply that happiness, uh, understood as the, the moral excellence of an individual, that's the natural end for all human beings. It's the reason, uh, it's the, re the, the raison d'etre, right? It's the, it's, the, it's the why of humanity, the de haute, uh for Aristotle. Now, as you could probably know from your own lived experience, but Aristotle also explicitly mentions that there's a very peculiar feature of men and women, of course, uh, by men, I mean the, the old school use of the term men, not people, but we are in Canada, so maybe people, uh, you know, people them, um, or people kind, I think is the way it's supposed to go. At any rate, um, men and women don't typically arrive at having, in fact, Aristotle makes the pointed observation that it's very rare that you meet a virtuous person, right? I mean, you'll meet a morally weak person or a morally strong person, but it's really rare to meet the, the man of, of true excellence who, you know, who is in fact happy, the, uh, you know, the phronimos, he would call it. Um, that's just not very common. Now, I, I'm sure you've already stumbled into what the challenge is here, right? The challenge is that if natural kinds of things always or for the most part arrive at their natural end, and that's actually a part and parcel of being a natural kind of thing, and human beings, Aristotle thinks are natural, but they don't, in fact, they quite rarely arrive at their natural end. So it, what does it mean? Are we natural? Are we unnatural? You know, Aristotle himself wonders this. Maybe we've got a little bit of the divine in us. Maybe we're divine ourselves, but something is wrong. The universe is broken. If every natural kind exhibits a particular symptom and we don't exhibit that. So Aristotle, um, this I believe is in the background of a lot of what Aristotle is doing when he um, combines his, his uh, sort of more scientific and ethical works, right? So you've got, you know, he's trying to understand the nature of the world with the physics, the metaphysics, the heavens, uh, the, the, the anima, everything. And then he's got this weird thing called humans that you got to deal with because they seem to be part of the system, but they break every rule or certainly the most important rule, namely the uh, natural completion in their telos. 
So man does not always, or for the most part, arrive at his natural end. And uh, part of the reason for that, I believe, uh, well, <laughs> well, we know why that is as Catholics, right? So uh, Aristotle didn't have the intellectual tools um, to identify it. Augustine did for us, right? There is a fundamental break in the nature of reality as a result of our disobedience to the Lord. But uh, Aristotle didn't know that at the time, but he did recognize the symptoms of it. So we have this issue um, we have this issue that most people don't arrive at happiness. Okay, that's the first part of this lecture. We've got three more to go. The, the next part is let's think about what this natural end of happiness is and how any individual would get to it if we were to get to it at all. So uh, most of you, I suspect, have read some part of the Nicomachean Ethics, but if you haven't, it's one of the best books ever written, uh, full stop, right? So it would be one of the 10, of course, behind the Bible that you should take with you uh, if you were ever stranded on an island. It, you might as well take the whole collection of Aristotle's stuff along with Thomas's and whatnot. Uh, but anyway, the, the ethics is definitely one of the keepers in the history of, human, of humankind. That would be a good thing for aliens to find as distinct from uh, whatever Snooky wrote. Um, but anyway, uh, they'll probably find the other one, uh, just the nature of the world. So happiness, that's our natural end. That's the thing for which humans were made. Uh, you know, we're not thinking about supernatural makarios, which Aristotle does mention, and that's what Christ says uh, in the Beatitudes. Makarios is the person who, uh, you know, is poor spirit when that blessed is really how that translates. Um, but uh, happiness, eudaimonia, the objective and lasting state of having a good spirit, it, it, this is the natural end for man. And how do we arrive at that? Well, we arrive at it through formation and training and education, right? So in the Nicomachean Ethics, Aristotle goes to great lengths uh, explaining exactly how it is that human virtue and excellence can and does, or rather is, achieved, right? And he observed most especially in the moral formation and moral virtues that you have to practice these things, right? Uh, you don't just wake up and are virtuous. In fact, Aristotle is going to give that as a mark of an unnatural man if you were to wake up and be virtuous without any formation or training. That's not how we do things around here, he would say. Uh, you got to grow. You got to pay the dues. You got to you got to exercise your faculties independently of coercion in order to develop these habits. And what's very peculiar about virtue, and and um, I think he did take this a bit from Plato's epistemology, is there's this weird transition that happens. One day you're doing something and it's not virtuous, right? So your mother tells you to brush your teeth and you hate doing it every day. And you don't like doing it every day. You, it's good for you. She tells you it's good for you. You don't really believe her. And then one day she doesn't got to tell you anymore and you just do it. And, and you have the habit of doing it. And not only do you have the habit of doing it, if she were to tell you to stop doing it, you wouldn't. Because suddenly it, it, it does make sense uh, almost uh, mysteriously that this is actually something you should do. And you should do it because it's good for you. And you're doing it simply because it's good for you. And uh, you don't really have an inclination not to do it. That happens. How do we know what happens? Because we've seen it in our lives, right? <laughs> I mean, uh, I'm not talking about mindless habits where we accidentally genuflect in the movie theater. I'm talking about things that we do because we know they're good for us. And it's actually uncomfortable not to do them, like brushing your teeth, I hope, <laughs> before you go to bed or after you wake up, right? That's really uncomfortable not to do that, uh, I think. If it's not, well, you know, it should be. But at any rate, at any rate um, this is how these things happen. So you get formation, you start doing things before you have virtue, and then after you do them for a while, um, you start doing them for themselves, and they're good for you, and suddenly it makes sense. The world all makes sense. Why you'd brush your teeth, why you'd stay fit, why you wouldn't eat, in 12, eat 12 pieces of cake when, uh, you know, when they're there before you. So Aristotle talks about this kind of formation, uh, and, he, and he specifically indicates that uh, childhood formation is key. So uh, this is not something that tends to happen once you've reached some age of reason, right? So this has to happen uh, in a certain sense precognitionally or pre-rationally, right? So Aristotle very uh, po popularly indicates that uh, adult humans can be happy, but children cannot, nor can cows or animals, you know, and no nothing without reason can be happy. And we'll explain that in just a minute. Um, but children most especially can't be happy. Um, and the reason that is most special is because they are little baby people. But for Aristotle, they're not fully rational. And you have to be fully rational in order to be happy in the sense of human happiness. And the reason for that is that these habitual activities that you do, they have to be the mean between, between extremes, right? It's neither too, more, too hot nor too cold, right? That Goldilocks, right? It's neither too, too hot nor too cold, it's just right. 
and and you say to yourself, but how do you determine determine what is the mean in any of these moral circumstances? Well, it is the thing that permits you to flourish. So, for example, if you were to become a glutton, decide to eat every day for the rest of your life uh, and way in excess, you would gain a lot of weight. You'd become unhealthy. Uh, your mind would become slow, and eventually you'd become physically incapable of eating anymore. Not because you couldn't you couldn't uh, you know physically engorge uh, or rather uh, swallow things, but you simply would be too fat to move, right? You couldn't go and get stuff. Um, and so what happens is, is, is when, you, when you hit one of these extremes, you tend, to, uh, uh, you tend to lose the ability to do the very thing that was the extreme as well as many other aspects of life. So, so the, the point is, is this mean is determined precisely by what makes a human being flourish. So um, this is why, you know, when a 90 pound woman comes in to eat a steak and mashed potatoes, she gets a sliver that's about this big and, you know, a little scoop of potatoes. Uh, and then when a 290 pound linebacker comes in, well, he eats, you know, half a slab of beef and, uh, you know, a, a basket of potatoes. Neither of them are eating too much, right? They're eating uh, just what they need to eat uh, in order to maintain the kind of thing that they are and the kind of things that they do. Um, this is not, this is where, you know, a very uh, nice way to say it is Aristotle's ethics are relative without being relativistic, right? So there is a right and a wrong answer, but depending on the circumstances, that right and wrong answer is going to shift. And that, that's going to depend on many different features. And this is just normal common sense stuff. I like to remind students who say that this is normal and common sense. Uh, so why is Aristotle writing it? Well, it's normal and common sense because Aristotle wrote it, right? <laughs> He figured out these patterns and then through the history uh, of the world it has trickled throughout uh, especially western education and come down to us as a, as a matter of common sense so uh, there's a bit of an irony in that uh, well it's not an irony it's just a, a, a cute feature of uh, of the way that we think is that aristotle we're thinking like aristotle whether we want to or no and also people who tend to oppose aristotle's mode of thinking tend to do so by way of <laughs> his mode of thought so it's a bit funny there at any rate, human formation leads us to this happiness, right? And it's composed of both uh, excellence and the moral component, that is to say, deal, dealing with pleasure and pain, and in the intellectual one, uh, you know, dealing with the eternal truths, the, art, the ability to artistically make things according with the truth of the nature of them. So human formation is really important, and what's, what uh, is kind of important, especially for this lecture, is that your pursuit of happiness begins before you can pursue happiness. That is to say, you're ushered into it by the generation before you. Thomas Sowell has a great expression. It's basically, uh, with every new generation, Western society is effectively staving off the invasion of the barbarian horde, right? We only have a certain amount of time to form them up into little beings that aren't going to simply turn on us in a rage of passion and destroy us. I know that's very insightful. Uh, it speaks to the same truth, however, is that human beings they, uh, they flourish, they, they, they reach their natural end in the context of other human beings. In fact, you, know, you would not be able to be virtuous if you did not have human formation. And that only would come by virtue of your caregivers. And you see this scientifically, right? In the, the rare cases of feral children who don't end up uh, being, they're not really raised by people for the first six or seven years of their life, right? So they lose the capacity to really speak. They lose the capacity to engage in some of the higher activities of humankind. Uh, and that's uh, irretrievable for them. So the point is, is that we need each other from the very beginning. And, and without, uh, without people directing us in the right way, we would never be able to get to happiness in the first place. Now, for Aristotle, it's important to note, and, and when we shift into the next part of this lecture, uh, we'll get there. For Aristotle, this is not merely a, a fanciful insight, right? He's not simply, oh, this is such a nice thought. We should kind of keep it together. It brings us together. Kumbaya, let's get out the guitars. We can sit on the grass and throw the frisbee. For Aristotle, this is a really scientific thing. It's not simply that, you know, it's going to be hard to get to our natural perfection if we don't have help. We cannot do it. We can't do it. It's impossible. We are not what we are without it. And that is a natural segue into the third part of this lecture. The third part of this lecture is how Aristotle understood the polis. Now I'm saying polis because city doesn't quite capture what a polis is. Um, a polis is a collection uh, bound by constitution, uh, a constitution and laws, a collection of people that have got together and for Aristotle in particular are pursuing the good life. Now, 
that might seem idealistic, but he's got a very carefully crafted description of how the polis uh, builds up, right? So the first cornerstone for Aristotle is the family, the relationship between a man and a woman generating a family. They get together not only for the propagation of the species, which is a natural impulse for all living things, but also for the securing of the immediate needs here and now. Now, uh, we won't go into the slavery issue around Aristotle, but he also did say that slaves were uh, kind of an important component of that. He's talking about his natural slaves, which are different than slaves by conquest. Just to say it, maybe you'll ask questions about it later. But so the family develops, uh, and then from the family, you get the village. And the village is just a collection of families who have realized that living together allows them somewhat uh, to secure uh, food uh, and, and you know, the natural resources they need uh, in the future, for the future. But it, it doesn't really permit them to flourish as human beings, right? So they're still really worried about, you know, day-to-day -day activities, you know, getting enough food for next week and whatnot. And then what happens is that naturally develops into the polis. Now, the very uh, important line here is Aristotle says that whereas the family and the village form originally for, for the good, and what he means there is the ontological good, the good of the species, um, the, you know, or rather not the good, sorry, the, um, they form for the sake of life, right? For the, the propagation of the species, the securing of the life here and now. The polis uh, forms up as a natural growth from the village and the city and, and ultimately as the final cause of the village and the city for the sake of the good life, the yutsane, right? So he says these things start for the sake of simple life, right? The living, the kind of life that animals and plants have, right? So you, you, you keep the species going and you maintain daily activities so that you can survive, the individuals can survive. But the polis happens and, and, and spontaneously by virtue of a natural developmental process for the sake of the good life. And what he means there, of course, is a life of excellence and virtue. I do have to realize, uh, just take a quick step back on human formation uh, the, the previous section of this lecture, I, I forgot a very key component, I, although I did mention it, but it's really important here, uh, and it will be important for the subsequent section. When we talked about these moral, these means between the extremes and deficiencies, uh, that mean is determined by reason, right? So the mind can recognize values that are either good or bad for a particular entity or in a particular circumstance. And the way that, that any individual does that is through the act of deliberation. So what it is, is you come to a circumstance, you see 12 pieces of cake on the table, you say, hmm, I want some cake. Uh, maybe I should eat all 12 of those pieces. But then you say to yourself, you know what? That's gonna give me indigestion. I got other people to think about. If I did that every day, I'd, you know, I'd lose my, my, you know, my philosopher's figure. Um, so I think I'll only eat one. So that's a rational thing. And what happens is, is you, um, you desire only one piece. You know, when you're really fit and healthy, you're not going to want 12 pieces of cake. Just the thought of it's going to make you nauseous uh, or nauseated. And one, and you know, not eating cake is not going to be pleasant either because sometimes eating cake is nice and good. So this mean that's determined by reason is, is sort of the crucial component for human activity. Human activity is, you know, Aristotle says in the Ethics, uh, book three, you know, humans are nothing if they're not either desiring reason or reasoning desire. And what he means by that is not actually reductive. Um, what happens is our bodies have natural desires and those natural desires can issue in, in, in ways that typically will be good for us. But there's a degree of human life that, that can go beyond even those desires and that can, 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 uh, can craft them and to make them rational and reasonable. The example that I've given, and, and a lot of times people see the moral virtues of virtues of restraint, right? Most especially temperance, which deals with food and sex. Right, so temperance is a good virtue in that it holds back. But really, uh, if you have to hold back your desires, you're not really virtuous, right? What you are is you're morally strong or morally weak. But the point is, you don't really have the virtue of temperance because what temperance does is actually it adjusts the appetite to the circumstance rather than simply refraining an excessive appetite. Um, so, for example, if every day uh, you eat two eggs for breakfast every day for three years, and that's that served you well. So you wake up, you're hungry for two for for two eggs. You're not hungry for more than that. You're not you know you're hungrier for uh, you're hungrier for less than that, uh, and you're not hungrier for more than that. But then one day you say to yourself, I'm going to go climb a mountain. I'm going to climb a mountain today after breakfast. Well, if you're really a temperate person, uh, and it's not like you know uh, you have to say it to your belly, right? You, you got to understand it. If you're a temperate person, you'd be hungrier. 
And the reason you'd be hungrier is because uh, climbing a mountain is, let's say, more than your usual daily activity. And so the virtue of temperance adjusts appetites to meet the circumstances based upon rational realities. Now, again, it's not as clear cut as that. You don't suddenly say, I'm going to climb a mountain tomorrow, and then you get hungry. Uh, the idea is that your integrated uh, mind and body such that your perception of the world as it is uh, understood by the mind actually is integrated with your moral being and your appetites uh, are adjusted based upon those rational considerations. Now those rational considerations issue precisely by virtue of deliberation. You say to yourself, I'm gonna be climbing a mountain, so what do I need? Other than shoes and gear and probably black fly spray, you also need um, to eat enough food. And when you get to that bottom step, that deliberation, though it's very heady in a sense, because you're thinking of constant, you know, principles to consequence, you don't conclude with a proposition. You don't say, huh, so I should eat more. No, 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 you eat, right? So deliberation is that special feature where you integrate thought and action. And whereas you might be thinking about something when you begin deliberation, the conclusion of any deliberative syllogism is the action itself. So, you know, you step back all the steps. So let's say you want to get an A on a paper or, you know, you, you, some of you aren't in school anymore, but we'll use the A as an example. A a paper, you got to do what the teacher asks. What does the teacher ask? Teacher asked me to write a paper. Okay, so what do I need to do to write the paper? I have to get out my computer. Okay, so what happens is once you realize you got to get out your computer, it's not even a realization. I got to get out my computer and it happens, right? So the conclusion is not, oh, I have to get out my computer. It's you get out the computer so that you can start typing. And that's very important that deliberation concludes in action, not in a proposition. And, uh, and this action is itself in accord with reason. So what it, what it really does is it infuses rational principles into desire. Uh, so you desire something not simply because it meets an appetite, but you desire it by virtue of it meeting a rational appetite. And those appetites that you have as part of your body can be rationalized. Uh, <laughs> now that we rationalize away, uh, responsibility, but what happens is, is you can begin to desire things rationally. This is why a temperate man can both, uh, who's married, can both acknowledge the beauty of another woman, but not find her sexually, you know, appetitable, as it were. Because temperance, you know, he's only got the appetite for his wife, and his wife is the appropriate object of that appetite. And so he can be sexually, you know, interested in his wife and acknowledge the beauty of another woman. And, and those two things are very distinct. Um, this is an example of somebody being temperate. Uh, the appetite is controlled by the virtue, the, the, rather the appetite issues in the virtue. It's not, it's not about restraining, it's just that the appetite is the expression of the virtue. Okay, it's really important that deliberation is, is mentioned about human formation, but now we can go back to the politics where Aristotle indicates that the polis is really meant for the good life. It's not simply meant for life as such. So in the polis, you're supposed to be able to pursue the features of human life that don't really issue in practical ends, right? So you don't think about the nature of metaphysics. You don't participate in Zoom conferences like this for the sake of, uh, uh, you know, of getting food into your belly or any sort of practical need, right? These are goods in themselves, and in a certain sense, they're useless. <laughs> and it's by virtue of being useless that they, uh, they, they are indicated to be something higher than the simple order of utility which is something that only humans can experience for Aristotle. So it's really important now, the human uh, being has as a proper context, the city, the polis. And so Aristotle very clearly indicates in the politics that any, any human being that, that doesn't have a city uh, is not really a human. Now he's not talking about, and he says, now it's not I'm talking about people who are exiled or people who grew up in a city and got kicked out or wandering between cities. He means, Literally, if you were to find a man in the desert who had never been in a city before, and he either was virtuous uh, or a bestial, right? He, he wouldn't be a human. That's not how humans work. He'd have to be a god, or Aristotle would say he'd have to be a, you know, a, an animal or a god, but he wouldn't really be a human because humans have their natural context. And that context, without that context, they can't develop. It's like taking a penguin out of the Arctic, right? So penguins don't do well in deserts. Um, it's not their natural context. If you were to take a baby penguin, hatch it out in the desert, it would still die. It, you know, it, it doesn't adjust to its context because that's not the context in which penguins grow. In a similar way, human beings cannot perfect themselves naturally without a polis. Uh, and, and you know, we mentioned it earlier before, part of that is because we need human formation. Um, but Aristotle, is, this is a very interesting uh, point in the politics. Um, he, he indicates this in a very special way. 
and I'm sure all of you remember uh, the line, man is by nature a political animal. Um, so that's not too surprising based on what I've just said. And we probably all remember that from reading Thomas. Thomas got it from Aristotle. Uh, he probably got it from the nature of reality and therefore got it from God. But uh, Aristotle wasn't a Catholic or a Christian. He just, you know, he recognized things. Um, but what is very interesting is Aristotle says that the reason that humans are by nature political animals is because humans have logos. Now, the reason I say logos is because we, well, first, we all know what logos is, kind of, right? So Christ in the beginning was the logos. But logos can mean many different things in Greek, right? It can mean speech. It can mean word. It can mean reason. It can mean, you know, rational, as it were. And so, you know, you say to yourself, well, yeah, Aristotle saying humans are by nature political because they have reason. Nope. Well, I mean, yes, but no. Because he immediately says that uh, contrasting it to other animals who only have phonos, voice. So what Aristotle is really saying is the reason that we're political is because we can speak. We can speak to one another. We have speech. And you look at other animals, they can make noise, and those noise can kind of indicate a few things. But speech allows us to articulate the world in rational ways that we couldn't otherwise articulate it. Uh, there's a very interesting phenomenological point here. Uh, that Aristotle seems to touch upon, and that wasn't really uh, focused on, I want to say, you know, until 20th century phenomenologists, um, most specifically Robert Sokolowski, studying under Husserl, and a few other people, um, is that we are bespeeched beings, and, and we often think that what speech is meant to do is externalize our thinking. But what the evidence suggests is, is thinking really is internalized speech, right? So we learn how to think by being spoken to. And it's only after we've been spoken to that we can actually have a thought. Again, you see this, like I mentioned earlier, in feral children who aren't spoken to, and therefore they, they no longer can speak, and they can't even actualize the higher capacities they have within them. And this, of course, does play into the whole triune God, right? The we comes before the I. That comes uh, from Buber. And uh, so there was a trinity first, and so often we think, you know, the collection of we's, or the, a we is a collection of I's, but really individuality falls out of community, as distinct from community being formed by a bunch of individuals. Aristotle's just recognizing this feature. Our individual perfection is only possible within the context of human interaction, and human interaction, as distinct from the interaction of anything else, is primarily speech. Um, and so speaking is a very important and, in, in fact, a distinguishing trait of human life together, speaking to one another. Okay, so we're going to pause here for a moment because we have the first three sections of the lecture, but I do need to recap a few items. The first is that the nature of things is such that everything has, everything that is natural has four causes, right? An internal principle of motion, which is our most important one for this, for this purpose, a final cause, a formal cause, and a material cause. We also know that natural kinds of things always are, for the most part, arrive by virtue of this internal principle of motion combined with their final cause to their natural end, right? Baby cows growing to big cows. Uh, but humans are weird because our natural end very clearly is happiness, and yet very few of us ever arrive at that. But we are natural. We're a natural kind of thing. We're somewhere right there in the middle of the chain of being. We're not at the top. We're not at the bottom. And normally, you know, tops and bottoms can maybe have exceptions, but we're right in the middle. So what's going on there? So in order to do that, we have to understand what is our natural end of happiness and how do we get there? Well, we get there by virtue of formation that occurs before we can even really take initiative on our own. Uh, but after we get to a certain age, then it is, of course, our responsibility. And it's by virtue of doing habitually repeated actions that allow us to get these mean, these virtues that are the means between extremes. And uh, the recognition of those means happen to be connected to reason. And reason is what identifies them. Reason is what recognizes them. Um, and, and what happens is, is those naturally desirable things become so by virtue of there being not only uh, a natural good ordered, uh, you know, that is the object of an appetite, but by virtue of being reasonable things. And that deliberation is the thing that allows us to make choices here and now for the sake of developing habits, for the sake of making the decision in the here and now about what is good and bad. And it concludes naturally in action, not simply in a proposition. Now, finally, we talked about 
um, this special relationship that humans have to formation, right? And so Aristotle naturally concludes that we need a city, we need a polis, this big sort of, uh, I, I mean, this big this community. I mean, for him, polis were not very big, you know, it was too big if you could walk across it and, and, and if you had to walk across it more than three days. So they're not massive things. We're not talking about the city states that we have now. We're talking about polis, right? So uh, self-contained units of social interaction that are guided by constitutions. So those would be the laws. Uh, and interactions between people so that virtues could be developed and, and a sufficient amount of leisure could be had. Um, so without these polis, humans don't, aren't what they are. Uh, they can't be formed in what they are. And, and the reason humans are especially social, uh, or rather the reason humans are by nature political animals, that is to say they need this context of the polis, is because they can talk to one another. Speech is very, very important, right? So now when you put all this together and you say to yourself, well, you know, men and women are natural things and they have a natural end to arrive at them. Um, everything has this internal principle of motion that directs always or for the most part to their natural end, but mankind doesn't seem to have something like that because, you know, speaking is what makes him special, but he very rarely arrives at his moral end. Yeah, his body grows naturally, but this moral formation doesn't seem to happen naturally. And I would expect certainly that this natural development would be related somehow to the thing that makes him different. So the enter now, uh, so, so what the problem is, is that humans don't arrive at their natural end and we don't, we don't seem to have some principle of motion that will always or for the most part lead him there, right? You can't, uh, and the reason it seems like we don't have that is because not, not many people actually do always or for the most part arrive at the virtue of life. So what we're looking for, what I was looking for when I prepared this presentation was a reason, uh, was, was some, something that connected to human speech uh, that was found only in a political context and that could, could effectively be a, a kinetic or an internal principle of motion for human action um, that nonetheless doesn't necessarily come from within the individual themselves uh, and nor does it make moral decisions um, mechanistic. And in that we find rhetoric. And so when you read in Aristotle's rhetoric about uh, the nature of rhetoric, the nature of rhetoric is that it is meant to uh, persuade people, right? It's meant to persuade people. Now, Plato doesn't like rhetoric and Aristotle confronts him on this in book one of the rhetoric. And for Aristotle and for many interpreters of Aristotle, uh, rhetoric is sort of um, an endless, and by endless, I mean that technically, it doesn't have a real proper end outside of itself, right? You can use it for good or bad. It's like a stick, right? You can use a stick to fish, which is good, unless it's not your pond. Use a stick to beat a dog, which is not good, unless he's attacking you. Uh, but the point is, is that, you know, sticks are relatively amoral. Uh, it just uh, depends on what you put them to. Well, rhetoric, for many interpreters of Aristotle is like that, but I would disagree. And I think the text of Aristotle's rhetoric uh, says the same thing. Aristotle very clearly indicates that rhetoric, um, its focus is persuasion. And it's not meant only to persuade to anything whatsoever. And the reason for that is because speech as a natural feature of human life has to be connected to this natural end of the human life, right? And so he, he very explicitly says, you know, you shouldn't use rhetoric to persuade to base actions, of course. Um, and you do have to use rhetoric to defend against bad rhetorical positions. Um, and, and you have to use rhetoric because the truth, well, rhetoric who's focused on persuasion, the true and the good are always more persuasive than their opposites. So rhetoric, if it's focused on persuasion, is always going to focus on the true and the good. Uh, what's very interesting in the physics, Aristotle also mentions, mentions the counselor. The person who uses rhetoric, he, he indicates that as an example of a kinetic cause or a motive cause, as an efficient cause, some of us would say. So here we have this art of speaking that causes action in humans, but how does it cause action? And this is really where the, the rubber meets the potato, right? Uh, we get to the meat and the road of the circumstance. Um, rhetoric is something that allows external deliberation to take place, right? Aristotle mentioned it in the ethics, that whenever we are trying to make a, a hard decision, we call upon our friends to give us advice. And whatever advice wins out, um, we make that decision, right? So kind of like if I convince you to give me $20, if I convince you to give me $20, not if I rob you, but if I convince you to give me $20, somehow uh, you and I both seem to agree 
uh, that giving me $20 is the road to happiness for both of us, right? So uh, I need the $20 for some reason and I get to happiness better. And, and you have been persuaded, convinced that this is the right thing to do for you. Uh, that's what rhetoric is. And, and, and the thing is, if, if you were to then say, well, you made me do it. No, I didn't make you do it. I convinced you to do it. And that's not, that's not forcing you into anything. In fact, it's appealing to your natural rational principles to recognize the good in a particular action. And that's exactly what deliberation does, right? The only difference being that deliberation happens within us, whereas persuasion happens by virtue of an external source of reasoning. Now, reason is always ordered to the good and the true. And so whenever we're persuading somebody, rhetoric is by its very nature something that is ordered to persuading to the good. Uh, a philosopher named Francis Slade has a really good article on end, the difference between ends and purposes. Um, and ends have to do with the nature of things and purposes have to do with the things that we put those things to. But he makes a very nice uh, observation that a doctor who uses his medical knowledge to kill someone is not doing medical things, right? It's kind of like if you're also trying to, if you're trying to build a boat and you start drilling holes in the bottom of the boat, well, are you boat building? Is that proper boat building action? Not really, because it doesn't make boats. <clears throat> in fact, it destroys boats. So in a certain sense, the activity, I mean, in an actual sense, the activity is dependent upon the end to which it's ordered. So in medicine, you kill with medical knowledge, you're not being medical. Uh, you might have knowledge that makes killing easier, but but killing medicine doesn't issue equally in health and illness, right? Aristotle makes this very clear point in the topics. Uh, there are some things that pertain to an end accidentally and some that pertain to an end essentially. So medicine, for example, essentially pertains to health and accidentally to illness or, you know, or harm. And that's because you can use that knowledge. Uh, you can use that knowledge to, to hurt people as well as you can use them to heal people. But he says, if you define something in terms of without making a distinction, if you say medicine is equally about health and about illness, you don't really capture the nature of the thing at all, right? You only really need to identify what the nature of, uh, of, of the essential part of something is. So rhetoric is the same way for Aristotle, right? Uh, persuading people to do base things or selfish things, that's not really rhetoric at all. And that's what Plato hated rhetoric for, right? He, he saw the sophists as being, as using rhetoric, but for Aristotle, and now I'm just telling you right now, this is going to be a contentious claim, uh, you know, part of what I do here, not, not make contentious claims, but it's sort of an, an insight of research. Uh, rhetoric really has to be ordered to the good life. Now, if it is ordered to the good life, then what we have in a polis is we have something like an internal principle of motion, right? So whenever individuals or groups of people are having a difficult time deliberating about a particular action, then what happens is you get the phony most forward. You get somebody who is, is able to speak using language in a way that appeals to the characters of the people that are listening in order to persuade them to do the right thing. And when you persuade them to do the right thing, what happens? Well, it's not you forcing them to do it. It's them kind of uh, piggybacking on your deliberation and then making a decision. Now, if you make a decision after deliberation, you're doing that one single act that is the beginning of the step into, in the right direction of virtue. And if you consistently do that, you're persuaded continuously by virtue of, uh, of speeches or the memory of the speech, what you're doing is you're beginning to develop virtue by doing something that you agree with, even if prior to that you didn't know. And so the point is here is that rhetoric, speaking well towards people, uh, not well, but uh, trying to persuade them to do the right thing of their own volition, right, uh, is a way that leads humans always or for the most part, right? So if you use rhetoric well, it's always going to persuade you to do the right thing. So always or for the most part to do the right thing. And that seems very much like the way Aristotle described an internal principle of motion for natural, for natural things, right? Um, and, and I, I want to point out that Aristotle is very clear. Things like torture, for example. That's not really rhetoric, although <laughs> if you're torturing somebody, you usually can get them to do the same things that you wanted to do when, uh, by persuading them. But the, the problem is with that, that's not um, sort of an internal acceptance of things, right? That's an avoidance of pain. Uh, but what it is, it's not really appealing to the rational nature of man. It's not making an individual say, you know what, you're right, and it's better for me to do this. Uh, that's just basically trying to stop it from hurting. And so Aristotle says, this is a non-technical means of persuasion. It's not even persuasion. I mean, yes, you have the same effect, but it's not really what persuasion is. And so it's very clear that persuasion 
is sort of like an external kind of deliberation. And once you are persuaded, you choose to do the right thing. This is why rhetoric has to be oriented towards the good of man, because it's a kind of speaking, and by virtue of that, it's uniquely associated with man and his natural end, which is happiness. And therefore, it has to issue in good counsel. And when you do that over a course of a polis, right, not only do you change the individual members who hear the speech, but eventually you integrate into the collective action of the polis the ability to adjust the constitution. So it's laws, which would technically be the formal cause of any polis, uh, adjust and, and adapt themselves to the principles that allow for human flourishing. So the point here is that Aristotle has a problem with humans. And the problem is that we don't always, for the most part, arrive at our natural end. And we're very special, right? We know things, we talk to one another, but especially we can speak, right? We can speak to one another and that makes us really special. And uh, so it seems natural that there'd be some internal principle of motion connected to this thing that makes us different that would always or for the most part lead us to our end, uh, lest we don't really fit in Aristotle's world. And, and he wants us to, although he admitted there are a lot of problems with that. Uh, and so of course, there's a nice happy reflection I've also had is that uh, you know, on this interpretation and looking at rhetoric in this way, we can see very clearly why Christ is the logos of God, right? He's the rhetoric. He's the speech. He's the thing that is to convince us uh, to do well, uh, but not force us into it, certainly, but to convince us. We look at him and we see him and we understand and we, you know, we love by virtue of seeing him and we, we ourselves conform, we conform ourselves to the goodness that we find in the logos, that's what happens when you're persuaded, right? You conform yourself to the rational action that the speech has suggested to you. You say, that is right, that is the way to be, I'm gonna do it. Uh, and that just connects very much, very nicely to the, to the nature of humans as they've been made in fact by God, right? We are interpersonal beings. Our individuality fell out, as it were, of the creative act of the Trinity. The Trinity who is one God, but three persons, so the we was present prior to the individual, right? And then, and then uh, you know, that's just our nature. Aristotle happened to have an eye for things like this. But when, but we really learn, as I wrote in my dissertation, Aristotle knew us as well as we could be known before we could be fully known. Because when Christ comes, and we are fully known, and the reason why we don't always end at our natural end is obvious, right? We have, uh, we have a break. There's a disconnect between mind and body, which Aristotle himself recognized but made it very weird to, to fit into the natural order of things. Um, and, and yet here we are with the logos of God coming to, to use what it is we are by nature, namely the speech beings meant to engage in a, in a dialogue with our creator. And, and we've accidentally uh, you know, muted God by virtue of original sin. And of course, it's not just through conviction and convincing that Christ saves us. Of course, he has the deliberate activity of the saving graces. But the point is, is that dialogue is what is maintained after sanctifying grace reunites us. So at any rate, I hope this was an interesting presentation for you. I don't really know we're going to do questions. I think they're going to show up eventually, like 30 seconds after I finish here. Um, this again was just a spiel on the value of rhetoric, trying to uh, identify it both in Aristotle's system as, a, as an actual natural good and, and an essential component to natural completion of man as an entity as well as to kind of speak well of what rhetoric is in its essence as distinct from a, from a, from a value-free art. All right, so thank you very much. I guess we're going to fire up for, for Q&A. Uh, none of you are talking, actually. So that means you can type, I think. And I will either answer this way or through typing. Questions, also. Questions are very good. Hey, howdy from Texas, Cram VR. Oh. That's Mark, my uncle. Hello. Ha. Well, thank you, Watenga. Yeah, Watenga, yeah, you can all read this, I suspect. So I don't need to, to read these things out loud. So one of the key things about being a professor is you can sit in awkward silences, but I don't know if the rules still apply for live streaming. Yeah, this is really funny because there's a delay there. Okay, so I'm waiting. Any questions, thoughts, insights? I hope you guys are all going to go read. Well, uh, this, oh yeah, here we go. Let's see. Anyway, is there a particular form of government or organization of the polls which just about conducive development of the good life? That is an excellent question. Um, 
So Brenna Worley has asked the question. Yeah, so Aristotle did think that it was the uh, well. He 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 broke it into three into three versions, which effectively amount to the same thing. And it's it's something like the philosopher king, right? So it's the it's the noble kingship or the aristocracy or the uh, or the well formed middle class. So what he was what Aristotle was about uh, in in his politics, he talks about. A real citizen of a polis is one who can both lead and be led within the city. And that requires of him an awareness of how, how interactions are supposed to work. So it requires full life of formation. And then at that point in time, you have the sufficient experience to make prudential decisions about matters of state. So uh, I know it, it's almost an unsatisfying answer to say, yeah, Aristotle thought the best polis was the one that was run by the phronimos, namely the, the man who is prudent. Um, now, it seems trite and a truism to say that, but what he's really getting at here is that as a, as a collective whole, uh, humans are ideally meant to be in polis that are formed this way and form them up. And it's supposed to be sort of a perpetual thing, right? The city is well-formed, making well-formed citizens, then citizens take over and keep the city well-formed. So. Yeah, uh, so so that is something that he would say is is the good city. But for him, it would have been the noble aristocracy or or having the middle class that was able to really um, live in a virtuous life. Yeah. Because so that was a good question. Uh, let's see. Here's a first question from Mary Claire Hessel. Second question, I should say. Is there a word <coughs> for what is used to persuade someone to do the wrong thing since it's not rhetoric? Well, so it's important here. Rhetoric is the act of crafting persuasive speeches for the sake of the good. And yes, I actually, it's a good point. Persuasion is itself ordered to the good. So what would, well, it's a similar question to what would you call a medical, what would you call the activity that a doctor does to kill somebody? It's not medical, right? Anti-medical? You don't want to say it's anti-persuasive. That gives the impression that nobody's acting. Um, I do think that the term sophistry is good here. So I do think that sophistry uh, could be considered to be a nice analog to, or sort of a contrast to rhetoric, right? So, you know, uh, Aristotle mentions in the ethics um, that, you, you know, you always find the mean and then there are two extremes, but sometimes the extremes are so very rare, it's hard to name them. So for example, uh, when you're intemperate, that's easy, right? Uh, we typically think that's an excess of like, but he says there is a vice of insensitivity it's just weird. We don't really have a name for it because it's almost impossible to find somebody who is not sensitive enough to pleasure, um, although it does happen. Uh, in fact, it happens, I think, a lot more ever since the Christian event. But uh, anyway, that's a vice to be insensitive to pleasure. So yeah, I would say sophistry might be a good, a good, uh, a good word there. Okay. Do I know if logos is used as a uh, word? Be complex. Well, I do know that John uses uh, logos. Uh, at the beginning of St. John's text. So uh, he uses it to describe Christ. Um, yeah, I mean, he says, in the beginning was the word, and the word was man and became man and was with God, all of that stuff. Yeah, he's just using word there. Does the rhetorical process, external reasoning, oriented to the good, presuppose virtue? It's an excellent question. And that is a really, um, that is very interesting. Um, I'm going to say no, it doesn't, I'll except there's one exception. Yeah, so you can understand the nature of an individual and the nature of what is good for that individual. And so the idea is, can an unhealthy doctor perform medicine? Well, definitely, right? He can understand the principles of, of the body and how it works, even if he doesn't follow them himself. Now, that is peculiar in the virtuous life because Aristotle makes it very clear that some principles of good action can only be had if you have the virtue already, right? So sometimes things just won't make sense if you haven't already been formed. So with the exception of those particular cases, you can very easily identify a group of people, what they need to hear in order to get them to do the right thing, even if you yourself don't have the particular virtue. Like for example, you can be a coward and you can encourage cowards to do the courageous thing. Now, you can't encourage them to do the courageous thing by saying, hey, man, step up and be a man. Uh, that doesn't encourage cowards. What does encourage cowards, for example, say, well, it'll be a lot worse if you don't do it. Uh, and that, that, that will encourage them to act out of fear in excess 
of the fear that they had in doing the right thing. And, and you can do that while being a coward. Um, and you can craft yourself in the persona of somebody who's not a coward to help do that. So I would say that yes, uh, rhetoric and, and the ability to persuade to the good without being good yourself is possible. The only challenge to that is where a, a strict argument is needed uh, would be difficult if some principles you couldn't have by virtue of your, your lacking the habit. Uh, okay, Andrew, in other words, yeah. And or certain virtues one must possess in order to participate in the rhetorical process is either the persuader or the persuaded. I think there is a limit of, I mean, there is a, a baseline of education and Aristotle makes it very clear. If you're gonna be a good rhetorician, you have to know a lot of different things. You first and foremost have to know the constitution under which a particular polis is formed, right? So if they are a constitution that values war and honor, you're not gonna be able to encourage them to do things by cautioning restraint. If they are a culture that values money, and power, you're not going to be able uh, to encourage them to to virtue by by using virtuous appeals, right? But to do the right thing. Like the right thing is to own stuff. Okay, so what you need to do is you need to show them how doing the right thing is going to permit them to own things. Now this is eventually going to wear down that disposition to uh, to like the wrong kinds of things. But so to be a rhetorician, it's actually a, it's a very a, for Aristotle it was one of the highest callings in that regard because you typically were, were swaying the lives of, of, of police. So you had to know a lot. You had to know all about human formation. You had to know all about the soul and you had to know all about constitutions and the way politics works. And that's why he encourages the rhetorician to know all of those things. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so your follow-up, I think, is answered. There are some kinds of things, some moral, certainly the moral virtues as distinct from the intellectual. Some intellectual virtues, or at least the height of their perfection, will be limited by natural capacity. And the moral virtues, some of them, well, some principles of action are only understood if you already have the virtue. Uh, at least that's what he says. You learn, you learn the principles by virtue of the habit formed, which is why it's really problematic if, if young people don't get formed well. Oh, this will be an awkward 30 seconds. I just sat there and watched myself say that. Other questions? Oh, another silence. Those are the only questions, for goodness sake. There's so many more. You can ask about the nature of the world, whether kettle, kettle corn is good. It can be anything. It's not. I mean... I used to like it, but that was when I was a child. Okay, uh, and nothing else? We can talk about other things other than Aristotle, although who would really want to do that? Everybody happy with uh, the world and the state of affairs as it is? Are we all planning for the end of it? Yeah, no, that's good. I mean, um, a good question is whether can you be a good leader without being a good person? That's a tough thing uh, to ask. I would, I mean, I think in principle, we want to say no, but in fact, we do see good things happening from bad people. And I guess that's the whole Christian context, uh, writing straight with crooked lines. Um, there are certain political leaders, for example, who are entirely, you know, they're lecherous completely, but they make good laws with regard to, um, you know, sex crimes and whatnot. I don't understand how that works. Uh, because in theory, the ability to recognize the practically good thing to do in any given circumstance is necessitated, uh, rather necessitates the, the, act, the, the actual possession of a virtue. Um, and this is not simply a matter of Aristotelian philosophy. I mean, this is the nature of what human humanity is. So we have to conclude either that people who make what are seemingly good laws uh, yet don't seem to possess the moral virtue that would they would require to make those laws. Those laws must be bad, uh, even if we can't see how they are bad, or there must be some other mitigating factor that, we do, that we're unaware of because uh, it's, it's just very clear, right? A lecherous person, uh, you know, a person addicted to porn isn't going to make good porn laws, right? Uh, that just doesn't seem to be the case. I mean, without deep psychological factors coming into play, you know, self-hatred and whatnot. So, but the question is, it wouldn't really be... Uh, 
a prudential thing, which is what you'd want laws to be. Oh yeah, I, you know what I can do is when I stop talking, I can type. Yeah, no, it's just part of a human being. Uh, yeah, just part of being a human. It's not a flaw, uh, but it does adjust his moral reasoning on things, right? So we might know this if we don't, don't let it make you hate Aristotle, but sickly children, he had no problem leaving out to die in the cold, right? Uh, they, he, he saw in them, uh, they wouldn't likely be able to flourish as a human being, the result, and that's not a big deal because, you know, there's nothing particularly special about a human child other than the fact that it has the potential of developing reason. And even then, it's just another thing in the world, right? It's not, there's no um, dignity that goes beyond the nature of what, what we are. So yeah, it was just part of being a human. Other questions, other thoughts? I mean, I can sit here all night. Because uh, it's fun, and I don't get to talk to the alumni as much as I'd like to. So uh, this is good. Interesting. I've not learned to bilocate. That is my darling wife, I assume, or my daughter, but probably my wife who's talking on my behalf, typing on my behalf. Good. So my daughters, they little Aristotelians. So I guess this is fading to black and I hope Metallica doesn't sue me. Shall we call it a, call it a thing there, Brenna? Worley is the one who is, uh, yeah, I think we're gonna wrap it up. Oh, wait, could I say more about the types of persuasion, ethos, logos, and pathos? How do they fit into this picture of human development? But a question just above my first, oh, uh, my first comment. Let's see. Uh, my first comment. My, my very, very first comment. It works. No, I don't see that. Maybe could you repeat that question, uh, Miss Mary Claire Hessels? Uh, but I will answer Andrew's question first. So uh, it's not the types of persuasion there, uh, ethos, pathos, and logos. The types of persuasion are um, a deliberative, encomic, and judicial. Uh, ethos, pathos, and logos are the three components that have to be considered when making a persuasive speech. So the logos has to do with the actual argument that you're presenting and the words that you use to convey that argument. Uh, the pathos has to do with an understanding of human emotion and how they arise. The reason, the reason for that is because human action is never divorced from the material component of the moral life. So there is always a, a feeling of either pleasure or pain and some variation of that that is going to name emotions. So for example, Anger is the experience of pain at the, perceive, at the perception of an injustice. So that's an emotion. So you have to understand how human emotions work because it's emotions that effectively drive us to action. And this is very, uh, very definite for Aristotle. Humans do not act based on thought alone, right? Uh-oh, there's a crash? Is there a crash? Maybe there's a crash. Tell me, restart Firefox. Restore session. Okay, let's see here. I'm coming back. Can you see me? Can you see? Okay, okay, I'm back. Sorry about that. Um, so human beings, uh, we do not act without emotion. So when we deliberate, reason infuses emotion, but we still have some feeling, either a desire for pleasure, okay, either a desire for pleasure and avoidance of, of pain. <coughs> so um, so when you understand the pathos, the pathway of people, you understand how
to work emotions. So for example, when we were talking about cowards, you can persuade cowards because you know they have an excess of fear. And so there's different emotions that pertain to fear that will allow you to, it's not manipulate, but to direct their activity in light of their emotional responses. So that's, uh, that's logos and, and pathos. Now ethos has to do with the character of people, right? So the character of people is gonna be formed by their political constitution. For example, in a secular Western materialistic world, our ethos is one of consumerism, right? Consumerism and immediate gratification. Now, if you know that, you will understand how best to use the emotional states of individuals because you know what interests them. You know that material gain is something that they desire. And so you can present things to them uh, that would suggest material gain or material loss that will affect whatever emotions that they might have, whether it's a perceived injustice, anger, if it's, uh, it's the delight of, of, uh, of, of receiving something happy, you know, the feeling of happiness, not the virtuous happiness. Uh, and then, of course, you do that by use of the logoi, right? The words that you're using, whether you select the right words or no. Again, the example is when you're convincing a coward. You're not going to convince a coward to tell him to step up and be a man. You're going to convince a coward by saying, It'd be, it'll be worse if you don't. So that's me knowing his character, he's a coward, understanding how to manipulate his emotion of fear by saying the right things. So those are components of every rhetorical speech. And uh, Mary Claire Hessels, could you repeat your question? I don't seem to be able to see it. Uh, I, is there a word for what is used to persuade someone to do the wrong thing since it's not rhetoric? Uh, that one I answered, I think it's sophistry really is the best way to call that. Um, yeah, I think that would be the best thing to say in that regard. But if there was another question, I'd be happy to answer it. Okay, anything else? Any other questions? Any other questions? Uh, well, okay. So kind of, uh, the other kinds of, uh, of uh, rhetoric do in, the, in a certain sense. And the reason for that is that they all, um, the reason for that is that they all do ultimately pertain to deliberation, which is a distinctly human mode of, of, of activity. So what I mean by that, Aristotle makes it clear that encomium, right, when you're praising someone, the best way to praise somebody is to indicate that what they did uh, was well deliberated, right? It was something that a rational person should do. So, you know, you don't say somebody who charged into the battle and saved everyone, you don't say, wow, he was really rash. You say, he took, you know, a very difficult situation and by virtue of the presence of courage in an excessive degree, or not an excessive degree, that wouldn't make it courage, but courage in a great degree, greater than the average man, his courage permitted him to charge into a circumstance that was not unreasonable and to win the battle. So that would be an encomian uh, debate. The same goes with justice. So when you're talking about judicial rhetoric, oh, okay, well, you can type that. So but anyway, when you talk about judicial rhetoric, the same is true. What you're trying to show in somebody being either guilty or innocent is either that they're guilty of a thing because they did it reasonably, they did it knowingly, it was the result of a deliberate act. Uh, or you show them as being innocent either by showing that they did not do that thing deliberately, right? This is the notion of involuntary manslaughter, or um, they didn't do it willingly or, or knowingly, or they were doing something that had a different intended outcome, right? So the deliberation, it's kind of like, have you ever seen that pitcher, Randy, whatever his name, when he throws a pitch uh, and it explodes a pigeon? Uh, he was trying to strike out the batter, not explode the pigeon. Uh, the pigeon happened to be there at the wrong time, and the pigeon blew up. Um, nobody would accuse him of trying to kill a pigeon. Uh, not that, you know, you, it's all that bad of a thing to do, unless you're malicious. But uh, the point is, is that wasn't an intended outcome. So in judicial rhetoric, you're still connecting uh, the persuasion to the reasonability of the action, which is what makes it human in the first place. So they are related to human flourishing, but you, you, you approach them from a different angle. 
We're gonna try and see if uh, if there's one more question. Ah, so children, children cannot be persuaded. No, no, which is weird because your checks do come through. Your other stuff comes through. Um, so yeah, uh, children wouldn't be persuaded, right? So you can be persuaded by virtue of having reason. Typically children are directed. Um, and as they become aware of argumentation, then they can be more persuaded. But by that time, then they're at the state of being able to, to rationally consider things. And though they still do need direction, um, they, are, they are slowly developing their capacity to be rational, self-directing adults. I mean, for, for children, I mean, the persuasion that children use is, well, because dad said so, right? I mean, you can give them an argument, uh, but that argument for them uh, is going to sink in as they do the activity itself. So, okay. You, of course, are all welcome to email me if you have any other questions or thoughts. Uh, I really enjoy doing this sort of thing. I'm, I'm really happy to see the, the response, the, uh, the come out, as it were. I count four people. Maybe there's a few other hidden ones there, uh, which is lovely. Um, last call for, for, for questions, comments, complaints. Maybe not so many complaints, but we'll take them anyway. It's really weird seeing me on a delay. Let's see where I am. Okay, well then I'm going to thank you all very much. I I really enjoyed this. I guess goodbye. Okay, I'm going to try and end this unawkwardly.